Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's doing well. Well, tonight's been a little bit chaotic in getting to this point, but I'm thankful that I'm actually sitting in the chair now. My wife has started back at work this week, and the daughter is also, the youngest has also started back at daycare. And that's been a bit of a challenge. And good, everything's good, but it's just been a lot of change and stuff. We got, Every one of us goes through those changes if you have children when everything starts back in September. So that's what we're going through right now. Today, I'm just going to touch on it quickly at the very, very beginning, and then we're not talking about it at all. So don't ask any questions about it. They'll come up, and maybe we'll do a live feed about it down the road. But uh, the farm is kicking my butt. <laughs> I'm absolutely exhausted every single day. Uh, I've taken this entire week off to be able to try and get all the fencing finished. The fencing's been absolutely nothing but problematic for one thing after another. It's been going on since June, and I, I, I can see the light at the end of the tunnel. I, I'm very, very gracious that my father-in-law and mother-in-law drove all the way from Regina, Saskatchewan. Yes, Regina, named after the Queen Victoria Regina. Uh, but uh, it's in Saskatchewan, it's one province over. It's about a six-hour drive. And they drove, and he helped me out for three days solid. And it was an absolute godsend, and I'm absolutely, truly blessed to have them in my life. They were willing to help me do all the stuff that they did because it's been absolutely painful. I've, I've got scratches and cuts. I know I can't really see, but it looks like I wrestled a lynx. <laughs> I'm just sore as hell. So tonight, I'm just going to be drinking just iced tea tonight. I've even got my back up. Uh, I'm just, I just took some pills. My back is super sore. My neck is super sore. So if I seem a little bit off today or <laughs> not fully there, that's exactly why. So no more discussion about the farm. All the animals are doing good. Moving on. <laughs> so nice to see you, James. You were here a few minutes early. I just walked down and I saw you there. And Chewy and Atkins Nature Aquarium, thank you guys for joining me. Wally from Supreme's here. Wally wants to talk about fish, apparently. All right. KG Aquatics. <laughs> well, tonight's topic. Now, how this really came about is I just think it's kind of funny. It's one of my plaques, one of my breeder plaques, one of my plaques fell off the wall. So that's kind of how the topic came about. <laughs> I was feeding my fish, and I noticed it when I opened the door. It was kind of sitting under the door. I was like, oh, okay, well, I was not sitting there. And it's, I guess the adhesive from 25 years ago is uh, kind of worn off and fell off the wall. No damage to it whatsoever, but that's what kind of gave the inspiration. I am struggling to try and it's not that I don't have topics. For me to come up with topics to do uh, these, these live streams, I don't want to just come out there and just do uh, a QA and a unless you guys want that. If you guys want that, I'm, I'm all for it. I'll do whatever you want. I would think those would be a hell of a lot easier for me to plan around with my schedule, especially in the summertime going into fall. Uh, but um, if that's what you guys are up for, I'm all for that. I do very, very much want to do – more of the isopod ones, but I know most of my following is not just isopods. It's most of it is fish-based or science-based or botanically based. So uh, the isopods, maybe we'll do one once a month and stuff like that. The isopod talk went over really, really well, and maybe we're going to pull in some really, really cool guests again. Maybe, uh, maybe Wally will come on. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> but uh, that's going to be coming. But I actually have some cool things in the work right now for that where I want to be using a different program where I'll be able to overlay pictures and all sorts of stuff. StreamYards, which I'm using tonight, I can, I can do all those things that I want to do, but they want $20 a month for it. And I'm just like, I just can't justify $20 a month just to be able to show you guys a few pictures during the live stream. Ah, maybe we'll get there. I don't know. It's My daughter is the nerd. She tried helping me figure it out, and, we can, and I couldn't figure it out. And she said, no, you got to do this, Dad. And that's where we ended up. But – when it comes down to the topic, most people that know me from traveling, most know me that know me through the speaking circuit and stuff like that. When I go and talk at other clubs, I've been known for breeding fish for a long, long time. And it's not like it's directly involving me. <laughs> My involvement's very, very minor. You know, like I'm not involved in, in the actual process. That's not me whatsoever. But, uh, I, I guess maybe my mind works in a different way. I'm no different than a lot of really, really, uh, there's lots of very accomplished breeders out there, and I'm no different than any of them. 
but I look at, I guess I look at nature in a different way. And I, and that rolls into the way I look at plants. That looks into the way I look at fish. And maybe it's just, I, I'm just a little bit different, but I view very, very much breeding fish or keeping tropical fish as a puzzle. And I go, you guys know that I've mentioned that before. Uh, but when I talk about puzzles, when it comes to tropical fish, well, it was the same thing when I was keeping reptiles is my role as an aquarist is to figure out the pieces of the puzzle, how they go together to basically give that animal, that species, let's say isopod, let's say a plant to flower or reproduce or a fish or a snake. It doesn't really matter, but to be able to provide an environment that meets all the needs and requirements for that species to replicate, and this is important, to its capacity in captivity. And that's that's very, very important. Now, breeding fish is what the main topic of tonight's topic is going to be, and that's one aspect of it. Rearing that offspring to, a, to adulthood and then re, uh, breeding them again, that's when you come back full fold. But i got a bunch of notes, as I always do. I printed them all off. I read a I wanted just a bunch of bullet points I wanted to rip through this morning. So I did this this morning and uh, just a bunch of little bullet points. And I ended up with five pages, <laughs> things that I just had to make sure that I was going to be able to talk. I look kind of, I look insanely bright in this light. I really don't, I, I look like I'm glowing. You guys don't need a glowing bigs. I don't think. Is that better? So Pel Pelpin Creek Aquatics, thank you very much for joining us. <laughs> Oh, my friend from down under is here. Thank you very much, my friend. And the lovely Adele. We got the Australian contingency. You know, the fact that I bug these Australians so much and they come back, they must love the abuse. Oh, I must come back to all those days when they spent being a penal colony. <laughs> so let's get back to breeding fish. Now, you guys know why I talk about I talk about the puzzles and stuff. Uh, I think one of the absolute most key things in breeding fish, and it doesn't matter what type of fish, or again, any of the other things that we're talking about, is just behavioral observation is absolutely the single most important key to success. If you are not going to be able to sit and enjoy and just observe your aquarium, your lizards, your plants, even though at a slower pace, every one of these things will tell you exactly what it needs and how to do it. You just have to use your eyes and perhaps other senses and other tools available to you to perceive and figure out what the, what the animal or plant is trying to tell you. Now, there's lots of easier, less challenging, perhaps more forgiving species to, that you could start off with and hone your skills. Anybody that's new to an aquarium, whether it's your, it's your brand new first tank, you start off with guppies, platy swords, mollies, any of those are ideal. If you if you got a slightly larger tank and you get into something like convicts, jewels, any of the riverine type haplochromines of yesteryear, like the Egyptian mouth brooders and things like that, most of the true cyclosomines, like the porticaras and stuff like that, they're not as sexy looking to some people, but I think they're pretty cool. If you're into the uh, African cichlids, any of the less aggressive uh, riff lake cichlids, the things that are more like the chromis that have the small invert pricker mouth or something like that, which is a topic for another day, but like your electric yellows or things like that, those are all ideal fish. And reality of any one of us has ever bred any fish. We haven't. The fish have bred. We've just happened to be there when it happens and witnessed it. Or all of a sudden we had a female full of mouth with fry, or we had fry up here in the tank, in the case of like my planted tank with the barbs and the different types of dalkinsias that I've bred in there. <laughs> Australia has just become a penal colony again. We cannot leave. Don't worry. Canada can't leave anyways. Like we, we can't, it's a shame. We can't go to the States. Nobody wants to go to the States. But <laughs> we can't go to the States either. The border is closed. <laughs> <laughs> um, so really a lot of tropical fish breeding is honestly it's just sheer sheer luck let's face it our role is somewhat uh, insignificant in the actual act of mating like i mentioned earlier right just some uh, we're just basically some old perverted nerds uh fogging up the glass of our aquariums as we watch the the, the dirty deeds go down 
So really, what is our role when it comes to breeding aquarium fish? Yes, I'm wearing my, uh, nobody's comment, uh, yes, but yes, I'm sitting in my squeaky chair. There's the non-squeaky chair right there. I could have used it, but I was running late. <laughs> At least it doesn't have crap piled all over it. <laughs> so basically, what is our role in breeding tropical fish? We have one very important role, and I alluded to it at the beginning, and our role is to be able to find a method to get to provide whatever that animal, species, creature, whatever you want to call it, needs to be able to replicate to its capacity in captivity. And what are we going to start with? We're going to start with a tub. We're going to start with a pond. We're going to start with a, an aquarium of varying sizes and stuff like that, and that's what we've got. Our role now is to put something inside that glass box or rubber made tub or whatnot and find a way to replicate an environment that is conducive for that animal to breed right so make sure i'm following my notes here and that's again like just the breeding part we're not talking about rearing or anything like that now i think the first thing that's most fu fundamental is actually understanding the species in question now, I turned my computer just a little bit today because we've got about four or five different species that we can see in the tanks that are here. I can see, you guys can see it, but I'm glad the definition's not that good because I still, to this day, have not been able to put out, I think, item number or number four or five on the vivarium because my dear friend in, in BC that helped me with everything with the lighting, it's like a three or four hour time difference for me or two hour time, I don't even know what it is. And he works He works late, so by the time, it's like I gotta stay up until like midnight, one in the morning, which just never happens. To be able to do a Zoom interview, record it, and edit it to be able to put something together in the video, because there's no way in hell I could take credit for the stuff that he helped me do with that lighting. And the thing that's the funniest is the lighting is almost over. <laughs> it's on this cycle, and the cycle is all messed up because of power failure. So the cycle still works. It's just on at totally different times of the day. So I'm actually genuinely surprised it's actually on right now. <laughs> but we're getting to that. It's going to come. So in the first tank here, we have uh, the Hypsorops nicaraguensis, which is that Nicaraguan cyclic that I talked about in one of those uh, videos when I rescaped the 75-gallon tank. It's a super, super cool species from Nicaragua, also in Costa Rica and other areas. Uh, but behavioral-wise, that species cannot be beat. It is absolutely outstanding. In the tank with them is a bunch of um, Mexican Gadeids, and this is my group of Xenotoka lions, Itamazula. There is a video coming out on them, uh, I believe, uh, Tuesday-ish? I don't know. Might be Thursday, might be Tuesday, I don't know. I've got about four or five videos that are up right now. And just sitting and watching that tank and observing their behaviors in that aquarium is really, really, really cool. You can see how they interact with each other. You can see in this bottom corner here, you guys can't really see it, but in this very bottom corner on the left-hand side, uh, there's one dominant female that is starting to sex out. She's right in the middle there. She's just below the wood. You see how she's very waspy? She's trying to dominate for territories and stuff. And in this one, the females are often very, very much more aggressive. Sorry, it's a, it's a male. It's not a female. It's a male. Dumbass. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Biggs is tired. Biggs is on meds. Biggs is drinking his iced tea. Leave him alone. But they're just starting to sex out. When I put these guys in there, it was right at the beginning of the whole COVID thing, and they were really small. So they're all getting around that three-inch in size. They're just going to get absolutely breathtaking color-wise. And then in the tank beside them, that's the Tiger King Aquarium. And the only other thing that's in there right now is uh, some gold barbs. I've got a dozen gold barbs in there with them as well. And I, I, I kind of rescaped the tank and planted it up again. And it's being taken over by hair algae. And I think it looks super, super cool. So I'm leaving it. <laughs> what is in that iced tea can? Nothing. Just iced tea. <laughs> But understanding the species in question, what I mean by that is when you're going to acquire a species, you got to know a few things, right? You got to know, one, you really want to know the proper name. I know everybody likes to use common names and stuff like that, but a true proper binomial uh, nomenclatural name is, is pantomount to, to, to find out the information that you're going to need. You're going to want to search on the internet or wherever sources you want to use and get as much information as you can about it. If you're going to be doing searches on the internet, most people nowadays are pretty sure to know about this, but like 
don't just look at one page and go, oh, okay, that's how it is. Okay, good. Do two or three. Pretend you're getting a quote for life insurance. Get two or three, read them through. If they all have kind of a general consensus, then it should be golden. But you want to know where it comes from. You want to know what its adult size is. You want to know something about its behaviors, its traits. You'll find out a lot of that basic stuff. What is its dietary needs? Those kinds of things. You want to find out as much of that basic stuff as you can before you bring that fish home. Because what if your biggest take you have is a 75 and you bring home a number of fairs, a snakehead, bad example, a lungfish, I don't know, you know, a dove eyes, anything that's going to get way too big. You bring home a stingray, bad decision, but stuff like that. Anything that you're going to be bringing home, you want to find out as much of the basic information as you can. So size, not only about size, but can they breed at a smaller size? Not just that, but when are they become sexually mature? A perfect example in cichlids, of, uh, one cichlid that you, most people rarely spawn, is the true parrot cichlid, the Haplarchus cynicus, which is the true parrot cichlid, not the one that people associate in the trade is that orange goldfish messed up fish. No, parrot fish. This is the true Peppa guy, parrot fish from Brazil and Venezuela. It comes from two different watersheds. There's a video coming on them down the road eventually. I just don't have enough video footage to put one together. But that fish takes years to become sexually mature. They could be big, but they may not be sexually mature yet, so they won't even reference each other as, as, as male or female. You know, you're know, you not going to be successful in breeding them. And that's no shot at you as an aquarist. That's just the fact that you need to understand and know about the species we're talking about. Understanding their level of aggression. Now, what we're seeing in this tank right now is that you're seeing the level of aggression has changed. I had a dozen, 10 or a, or a dozen, one inch, inch and a half inch, nondescript fish with a black stripe. No aggression whatsoever. Because these are only first or second generation from wild, they tend to be a little bit more waspy, a little bit more aggressive than the ones that will be what I'll call dumbed down in the aquarium trade that have been bred in line and line and line over and over again. Like things like think about your Oscar. If you ever dealt with a wild caught Oscar and bred them versus breeding a captive bred Oscar, it's a night and day fish. <laughs> it's totally different. Discus, angels. This is a perfect nod to all these amazing aquarists, you know, the, the, the forefathers, the, you know, the guys, the pioneers of aquariums and this industry. When the smallest tank they had, the biggest tank they could probably ever ever receive was probably a 20-gallon metaframe metal-based tank with a slate bottom. And these guys bred all those horrible mean fish. And horrible mean, what I mean by that is in a 10 or 20-gallon tank. But you take a convict cichlid, nigrofasciatus, and you put it in a 75 community, cichlid community, or in a larger tank, and you wouldn't think they're overly that aggressive. They'll hold their own, but they're not really like out slaughtering everybody. But you try and imagine what wild caught ones were like and trying to do them in a 10 gallon tank successfully discus, angels, all those other guys I mentioned. That's crazy stuff. So, a nod to those guys, our forefathers, for paving the way for us, so to speak. But not just understanding aggression, just how do they have aggression in an aquarium? And theoretically, would they have that level of aggression in the wild? That's not a good system for successful replication. <laughs> in the wild, if you were that aggressive in the wild that you just outright dominated and killed everything in your environment, that really wouldn't work well for finding mates. <laughs> it just wouldn't work well. If you kill everything, you know, how does that mean for success for you? So... Think about an umby, an umbraferis, that big giant speckled blue freckled monster cichlid from Panama, Colombia. Uh, this thing, if you if you were to take a the largest aquarium you could imagine in your home and put it in there with a bunch of other stuff, eventually that umby will probably kill most other aquarium fish you're going to place in that tank with it. It will just literally just badger and harass and beat on everything that's in that tank. And I know there's lots of people out there that breed them in a 100-gallon tank and a harmonious pair, but every one of those people also know that down the road, eventually that pair could have a discord and the female could turn on the male, the male could turn on the female. It's just things that can happen when you keep these type of fish. But I could literally take my entire basement, epoxy it, fill it with water, and set up a beautiful South American, Colombian type habitat and put a pair of umbies in there. Eventually that, that pair of umbies would probably slaughter most of the fish because they don't have a way of getting away from anything. They just don't. 
So understanding that aggression level is tantamount for success. But the other thing that's important in that is how can we control that aggression? Now, one thing a good friend from Montreal, Mr. Oliver Lucanis, who runs Below Water, has an amazing book on the Amazon. Uh, Oliver has spent many, many, many decades underwater doing video footage and, and taking high-end photography for all his things that he does all around the world. And he's noticed, and he does a presentation, he was involved with a company in Germany called Pantaray, where they developed this water pump uh, that uses a laminar flow. It's a different type of style of water pump. Very, very low current, and it produces massive volumes of water movement. But the thing that was really cool about this video, when he released this pump, is he actually did a presentation on understanding water current in the wild. And he showed like class five rapids. And then he took the camera and went below the water surface. And you'd see behind these, these giant boulders, angelfish, discus. These are things that we would never associate with being in these type of environments. But they were. And it's, it's, we've gone from back in the day where we used to keep these tanks and I'll use a, an old story where I used to keep an old Hagen 55. Now, this is a four foot 75. The old Hagen uh, lead glass black trim 55 was three feet by 18 by 18. And I've probably told this story before. And I was very, very successful in replicating or breeding uh, the original Steatocranus casuarius, the buffalo head cichlid. It's a West African species from the Congo. It's very, very common and popular in the hobby today. And you could replicate it in probably a 25, 30 gallon tank with a flower pot, a little bit of substrate, maybe a piece of wood, and a sponge filter. But in the 80s, when that fish was first coming out, it was challenging to keep it alive. And I think one of the things that I was successful with, and it wasn't that it was directly me saying, I'm going to set this up for this, is I took that tank and I used an undergravel filter, which was popular at the time, a very successful type of filtration if you, if you, you knew how to use it and maintain it. Um, I use that type of a system. I put the egg crate over top, probably four to six inches of good coarse substrate. And instead of driving it by air, I ran it with these four very large power heads. And it was full on class five rapids. And I filled the tank with these giant boulders. I see lots of questions coming in here. I'll take a break in a second there. And we'll kind of get and make sure I don't miss anything. I don't want to make you guys think that I'm ignoring you. But uh, that tank was super, super successful because I was able to establish this almost more natural environment for this fish that was first or first generation, but mine were actually wild cots that had come over and most perished when they came over because they, they we just didn't understand that they needed these things. Tuba, uh, the Lamina, the Madagascar, that bright neon orange fish from Madagascar that Jim Cummings has been so successful with. Well, it's, I guess, in fairness, it's, Jim has been successful. Jose Gonzalez has been successful. Leif de Mason in Florida has been successful. Uh, Jean-Claude Norsat and a few others uh, over in, uh, in France and stuff have been successful. This is not a species that most people are successful with. It is an extremely challenging fish to keep, let alone ever breed. Uh, Jim keeps them, though, in pretty much kind of, you know, crowded communities of Madagascar things. And now he's got him even outside in his pond. So if anybody's going to have success with that lots of area, it's going to be him. Leif the Mason kept him outside in this open eight foot by eight step down pond. And they were very crowded, but that was successful for him. Where well, you're talking about a fish that lives, if you even look at the physiology of that fish, you can tell it lives in extremely fast water. And it, it's extremely aggressive in captivity. Why? Because it can if you go and put on these massive water pumps, like something that you wouldn't even consider. So like when I build the 12 foot aquarium, it's going to have a pump bigger than you would put on a jacuzzi. And it's going to be for that purpose that I'll be able to put like 14, 15, 18 inch fish in that tank and they will have to fight the current, but they can be so, so aggressive without it. But once I put that current into place, they zip up, they come up there, they see a, a, a territorial male trying to come and invade their territory. They come up to fight it. And they hit each other, and they're both blown away by the current and stuff like that. So that's why these fish inhabit these regions. That's why you'll notice this hyperaggression level. So how do we deal with that captivity? That's just some ideas and some tips. Where are we back here? Big's got to get back. Okay. I'm going to make a note here where we are, and then I'm going to just do a quick little check and make sure that I'm answering some questions to you guys as we continue on. Iced tea, it is iced tea. No spiked tea. Biggs doesn't do that. Biggs drinks Jack Daniels usually. You guys should know that. 
What did Pippin Creek ask? I missed it. I missed it. Let's see what Pippin Creek asked. Where is it here? He said, hello, Adele. <laughs> oh, I don't know how I did that. How do I breed rope fish? Asking for a friend. That would be Haley. <laughs> if anybody's going to breed rope fish in North America, I'm going to put my money on Haley. She has an outstanding mind for the way she looks at the details uh, of setting up, not an aquarium. She doesn't have an aquarium anymore. She has an aquarium with like a bog garden around it in a greenhouse. She's doing it right. And uh, I think if anybody's going to be successful with it, it'll be her. Uh, so I really suggest you, you you watch her her channel and follow her on that stuff. If uh, one of you admins could pop up uh, Haley's channel, uh, that would be really, really cool because she's really doing some amazing work with that. I did a live feed with her a couple weeks ago when I was away, and it was a very, very good time. I personally know nothing about breeding ropefish. <laughs> What is the best thing to feed just hatch zebra danios? Zebra danios, uh, there, there's many things of them. They, they should be a pretty uh, a good a good species to start with. They'll often breed and replicate in your own environment of a healthy aquarium if there's lots of plant life. Uh, the microfauna that's going to li live within your plant life inside a community aquarium might be enough to get them started. Uh, if not, green water, rotifers, any of those type of things. Making these type of cultures is very, very easy. They're things that you can do on your kitchen windowsill. There's lots of videos on doing them. They're very, very easy to do. Uh, but honestly, hatching new, uh, newly hatched baby brine shrimp is easy too. But zebra danios are pretty, uh, pretty uh, easily farmed. You could use the, a commercial fry food, a commercial dry fry food, which you could buy anywhere. It's basically a high-protein uh baby formula. It's got a higher fat, higher protein content, and it's ground down to almost a dust. I tend to uh, like to emulsify in a bit of water, and then I add it using like a little pipette, turkey baster, depending on how many you got. And for that matter, you could buy the little cubes or the little frozen packs at any, any of your stores of the frozen baby brine shrimp, and those would work as well. Oh, Jason's got, yeah, thanks, Chewy. You put up her, her channel. That's good. Uh, okay. I'm StreamYards is different for me, so I, I've never really done these question things, but now I figured it out. On ram cichlids, parents are eating the eggs. Beth method for artificially raising fertilized eggs away from the parents and preventing egg fungus. Okay, Ryan, that's that's a very good question. Rams, rams are usually very, very good parents. The only problem being is rams are extremely far removed from wild. It's like same thing with a lot of these man-made discus they're just they don't have the the tendencies that they did back in the day uh you know it seems some of the they, they've bred them to develop all these great new colors and stuff but uh in, in doing so they've made the fish dumber <laughs> they've taken away some of their natural instincts and stuff but uh honestly raising a ram cichlid versus raising a, a dovi jaguar convict angelfish any of those raising them artificially is easy to do you're going to want to get yourself you could probably use a large pickle jar. You could use a small aquarium. It doesn't really matter. You could use a sterilized and cleaned milk jug. You're going to want to take the receptacle, whatever the, the eggs are laid on, you're going to want to take that. And I recommend that you take a little jar or scoop of water, placing the receptacle in there so they're not removed from the water. Some species are more delicate than others, but... Um, uh, the ram should be pretty straightforward. If you were dealing with a brand new wild caught fish that was really, really delicate, I'd make sure the eggs never saw air. And then basically transfer that that little receptacle in the jar of water, transfer the jar of water to whatever you want the hatching tank it's going to be. You're going to want to place it in there. And then you're going to want to add some sort of a product. Now, in, in the U.S. and Canada and North America, a lot of things have changed. And I honestly, I do not know what's available. But you're going to want some sort of a, a, a fungal product. Uh, an antifungal product, uh, anything methylene blue is what old time aquarists have had forever. Uh, I don't, it may be an ingredient in some of the things, but because I'm in Canada, Ryan, I apologize. I don't know where you are in Canada. We are very, very limited as what we can use. So any of us old time aquarists, when we knew it was about to kind of happen, we got kind of stockpiles. <laughs> uh, anything that's antifungal. If you can't find anything uh, chemical or medicinal, we'll say, uh, available to you. The other thing you could always use is uh, Pima Fix, uh, which is uh, the extract of uh, almond leaves, or you could actually just use almond leaves themselves. 
a lot of things, uh, epistos and things like that, when they're actually wild caught and shipped, they often are shipped in bags using pieces of almond leaves to prevent fungal things from happening on their fins during transport. So hopefully that works for you. But uh, basically once they're in that little jar, you're just going to want to, I use a little piece of rigid air line or a, an air stone and I bubble just gently by the eggs. So you're getting some nice current by the eggs and uh, that's it until they hatch, uh, depending on temperature. The other thing you can do to control the temperature so you don't have any, you don't have to put a heater or swings is if you take that jar, put the receptacle of the eggs inside that jar, aerate the jar, find a way to take that jar and then put the jar inside the aquarium and clamp it to the edge of the aquarium. That way the aquarium water will be identical temperature between the two. Just ideas. Hopefully that helps you out. Move on. No, 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 no. Marco, all the way from Italy. Welcome. Thank you. Yeah, we're going to do another live stream again. I love doing live streams with other people because it does feel as odd me just sitting here <laughs> by myself rambling. Usually if I have a couple of drinks, so it makes it a little bit easier, then I don't have to worry about it. <laughs> but only ice tea for today. So when we get back to understanding the species, the question dietary habits is important. We want to make sure we're feeding it the right foods. Uh, I've talked about it before in my video that I did with Dan Sharifi of feeding all the cichlids is when we look at the actual ingredient labels and we look at the protein content, some of them are far too high. This one's 41. And the best one we found uh, out of all of them, 44, you know, we want the proteins not to be too, too high. And we want a lot more fiber and natural product in there if we can. But knowing if your fish is an insectivore, knowing if it is a, 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 a piscivore, which is a fish predator, you know, these type of things, molluscivore, does it eat snails for a living? Understanding possibly the physiology, and I, I know this is getting a little bit deep, but do you want to go into finding about uh, the physiology of the said species, understanding their, their morphology and how their jaw structures work and stuff? So how do they go about processing different foods? You know, we could go really, really in detail in regards to the physiology of fish, but that would be an entire video entirely on its own. Uh, understanding like uh, how, how, how long their intestinal tracts are, denotes how, how, what type of dietary components they eat. Temperature is directly influenced on this because uh, you're dealing with animals that are cold blooded. So if the temperature is not incorrect, which comes to another factor in regards to environmenter, if the temperature is incorrect, you're not going to have success, but you're also not going to have success with the animal eating and processing its food that it needs to eat. Uh, so natural habit. Now, another thing in regards to when we talk about understanding species in question, when we talk to about, uh, about knowing where it comes from and how, is seasonal changes. Seasonal changes within its environment in nature. Almost everything South American, when we deal with Amazonian-based fish, they have massive, massive uh, changes in regards to seasonal change. Water influx, pH drops, water chemistry changes, influxes of protein and live food. All these factors all are what I've often referred to as triggers, and triggers are all part of piece of the puzzle that we need to figure these things out. So that's one, and then natural triggers add. Now, when we talk about environment, basically it's how much do we, as the aquarist, when we're putting together the pieces of this puddle, how much do we need to do to make Minga Minga happen, make the magic happen, make the, the glorious moment come together, the Angels sing down from the heavens and I get my little spawn and I'm all happy because I know I'm going to get my 20 points in my Breeders' Award program. <laughs> but how much do we have to do? Like when I talked about the South American stuff, a lot of West African fish will be the same. Rift Lake stuff definitely won't be. Uh, you know, it's, it's understanding what is required of us to make this work. Now there's triggers. Triggers are those things that we just talked about. But the other factors are the aquarium size. If I put it in too small of an environment, does it not settle in properly? There's lots of fish that you could breed in a bare aquarium with a pot or a mop or whatever it needs to breed. You know, there's lots, but some, there's no way in hell you'll breed that. Where are we getting at here? Tank mates. Now, the aggression level that we, we talked about earlier about this particular tank, and this is just starting because these fish are just starting to sex out. But the purpose of the live bears above makes them feel comfortable. And those live bears could easily handle a, a, a fair level of aggression, and they also dose out a fair level of aggression themselves. The only thing I'd like different in this tank 
is I think I'm going to take some of the bigger pieces of Anubias out of there that are really growing really well. And I have a nursery tank that's in the in the laundry room on the isopod rack. I'm going to digress for a second, but I'm planning lots and lots of changes. And if my wife is watching this, she's just going to roll her eyes because it happens all the time. I set up a fish room and I work with it. Everything's good. And then I change my mind and I want to do something a little bit different. I don't like the 75s. I don't like the stands. I just want to change stuff. I want some nice big, big tanks to work with. Like the 12 footer is going to be out there and that's fine. We'll probably start that this fall. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go whenever, but the farm's kicking my butt. Like we talked about, no talking about the farm, but I want to do something different, but I also want to have all my isopods out here and I want them somewhat displayed so during live feeds we can interact and talk about them and have all that stuff available to us as things change and modify so that's coming down the road as well but when we talk we were talking get back to it Biggs you got to get back because you always go off on these rants we were talking about tank mates yes or no depending on the types of fish you're talking about even if you say if you keep Central American cichlids Almost anybody that's ever kept Central American cichlids know there's things that we call target fish or dither fish, like we're using the live bears in this case. But if they're bigger things, one thing I've often used is silver dollars, large matinus species, red hook silver dollars. Some of them get really, really big. Triporthius carisins, the big uh, Triporthius tetras from South America. These, are, these aren't little tetras. These are like six-inch tetras that are like bullet fast, and they got really hard scales on them. Great, great dither fish, depending on the type of fish you're keeping. It makes the fish in question that you're working with feel more comfortable in their environment. And it reduces stress and lets them go about their natural behaviors that they're supposed to be doing and thinking about mating. And that's the other aspect of why dither fish are important. Another factor that's really, really important in regards to success, depending on the types of fish you're talking about, and I'm talking about all fish in general. Yes, I'm known in most circles for the amount of cichlids that I've worked with. I've done years and years and years of Tanganyikan cichlids. I've done years and years and years of Central American cichlids. I, there's not many I haven't bred. Uh, it's honestly the only, the only reason I haven't bred some of them is honestly either A, they've never been available, or B, they're just newly described and they split a fish into <laughs> a bunch of different things. Doesn't make me any better than anybody else. It's just when I concentrate on stuff, I've never been one of those aquarists that has lots and lots of display tanks. I like my tanks to look like display tanks, but honestly, once I've worked with a fish and I've gotten the piece of the puzzle that fish worked out, I move on <laughs> and I get a different fish. Now, I've evolved and I've changed and I, I'm drastically different in the position I'm in now and the house that I'm in now in that I've done every one of these fish that I have in my entire fish room except for... The Chetamulensis, or not the, the Chetamulensis, which I brought back from Alan and Karen, the bus, Bussing Eye, which I brought back from Max Sickles, the Alto Flavis, which I brought back from Rusty Wessel, but that's a fish that has been broken up and given a new name. Honestly, that is the only fish in this entire fish room that I've never kept or bred. And that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. But there's other challenges that I faced here that we'll talk about in a minute. But I wanted that particular fish because it's a fish that I could tell a story on. It's a fish that I absolutely love, is Nicaraguense. And somebody mentioned it earlier to talk about Nicaraguense. There's a video in this. Uh, I did a video on them on, on uh, rescaping the 75-gallon that pretty much goes into detail about everything about this fish. And it's, it's, it's just an absolutely awesome fish. I can't say enough about it. Where are we getting to? We talked about visual barriers. Visual barriers are, are really, really key because visual barriers – create the rooms within the aquarium you know it doesn't matter what it is if you want to use i have been to aquarist rooms i got a dear friend jonathan straczynski in ohio his fish room is a what i we would call jim cummings is another perfect example two very very accomplished breeders absolute masters of their craft but you go to their fish rooms and they are not beautiful laid out display aquariums they are very specifically engineered for large breeding move on, breed, move on, breed, move on. And that is the things that drive those individuals. So like either of those individuals, it's, it's clay pots and rocks and stuff like that. It's just all heaped in the aquarium, but it works and it works very, very well for them. And they're very, very good at what they do. And I've done that too. I just aesthetically want to have something a bit more pleasing uh, in my tanks now. 
and I wanted to enjoy those tanks a little bit more. And same as once the 12 foot's built, it'll be the same sort of style. It'll be a very, very natural styled aquarium. Uh, suitable spawning receptacles. That also plays in tune with knowing what type of fish you're working with. Uh, plecos like caves. Some plecos like caves. Some plecos, but do they need a clay pot clay uh, tube? Does it have to be compressed? Does it have to go to a point at the end? Can it be square? You know, if you ever see uh, my good friend Brantley Berry uh, at any of these shows for plecocaves.com, he's, he's got like six or eight tables of options for these things. And a lot of fish will use whatever. But sometimes you're going to get that one specific one that you have to figure out the piece of the puzzle. But that piece of the puzzle might be the piece of the puzzle that worked for the puzzle that you put together, not necessarily what somebody in Europe put together or what somebody in Nicaragua put together. It's it, The puzzle is different for different circumstances. And basically, a plant, if a plant feels threatened, a plant will do its absolute darndest, even on its deathbed, a plant will try to reproduce. Fish are somewhat the same. However, the, the structures and, the, and the, the systems within a fish are a little bit more uh, specific, I guess we could say, that a lot of things have to happen. And by the time that we witness that the, the, the fish in question is in such a decline in health, it's, it's probably past that area where it could have replicated. And truth be told, a lot of us have fish that are breeding in our aquariums and we just don't know it. it comes bring us back to that point at the beginning where behavior observation is absolutely key. Like, this is not going to, it's going to sound as a negative. It's going to sound like a shot towards, uh, <laughs> towards breeders of these styles of fish. It's not intended to be that. I've actually contemplated taking one of the big 160s and converting it over to something like this just because when I go to a lot of the farms in Florida, I, I just find them absolutely breathtaking. And I know Paisley would love it. So it's something I may consider down the road, but they've just never been my cup of tea. And what I'm getting at is people that breed Malawi cichlids. Now, I know that sounds extremely general. That would be exactly the same type of example as saying people that breed Central American cichlids. They are definitely not all created equal. But if you are keeping what I'll call all the bread and butter Africans that are available in the trade, all your imbunas or off-walk scrapers and stuff like that, every single one of them breeds in exactly the same method. So if you were colorblind, this would be the boringest fish in the world, at least to me. Maybe not to you. You keep what you like. But I know when I go into these uh, aquarium societies, I see these breeders' awards, and it's, all, it's usually on the top of the list. is always dominated by African cichlid breeders because for some reason they value these fish, you know, because they're colorful and they sell well in the auctions. They give them these higher than what I would value them in regards to points definitions for breeders award programs. All you need is you need to buy two of this, 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 and throw them in tanks. And I know I'm overly generalizing. And again, I apologize. It wasn't mean to be a, a shout out against African cichlid guys. But like, they all breed exactly the same way. If I were keeping African cichlids, I could breed 100 species in a summer. <laughs> but they're just not my cup of tea. And again, that's not, uh, you, there's some exceptional breeders out there. There's Florida Fish Farm. Josh Cunningham, for example, does an exceptional job with some exceptional stock, and I'm definitely not knocking it in any way. And I could spend days in Josh's basement studying his fish. I think he has an outstanding collection. So not to overgeneralize it, Central America is the same thing. If I were breeding all the different convict types, sure, the basic convict's fine. Uh, but you you talk to people like Alan and Karen, uh, they know very well who's bred. She's known as the convict queen. They are not all created equal. Some are a hell of a lot more aggressive. Some much more territorial. Some need a much bigger aquarium than you would ever think for a species this big. Uh, some are very, very peaceful and can go in a planted aquarium. You can't really see it because the lights are off. That's why I turn the thing. But it's understanding that fish. So suitable spawning receptacles, getting back to that. What about killifish? What about rainbow fish? What about kerosens and tetras or carps and goldfish? Well, then you're using mops. You're using different things. The guys that keep those things are using these mops that you guys have seen videos on. I did a video where you're wrapping yarn around a book and you're attaching a cork or a film canister or things like that. Or sometimes you're tying them to a rock for bottom spawners. 
goldfish, you know, these different things, the people that produce car, koi and carp on a large scale, they have these different types of mops. And when they spawn them, they're like bristle rushes, but large, large scale. It's just, you need to know what, how that species breeds and you need to provide it with the suitable receptacle for its spawn. So like your rams, Ryan mentioned earlier about rams, they need a smooth surface. Could be the a clay flower pot, but rams generally often breed on something flat. Angelfish, discus generally breed on something vertical. You know, blue acaras, all your most of your Central Americans, they tend to breed on something flat inside a, clay, a flower pot because sometimes they live in, in, in running water, rivers with a lot of current. So they would spawn on the underside of a boulder or behind a boulder. And those are the type of things where there'd be less current so they can tend to their offspring a little bit better and easier. Okay. So mops, slaves, caves, slates. Next one. What's we moving on to? We move on to water chemistry. I have no idea how long we've been going here. 45 minutes already, and Biggs is still just ranting. Before we go on to water chemistry, I'm going to highlight it because I will forget where I was. And I'm just going to quickly check and see if there was anything else. Candy has joined us. Thank you very much for being here, Candy. Honestly, you've been posting all the links and everything. It's absolutely an honor having you here. And Jack and Dan, Marco. Okay, Marco from Italy. A study of paracheriodons engaging neons carousid fish found that hatching is more difficult in medium hard water due to sperm alien, unable to fertilize eggs. Yes, 100% correct, Marco. And that's a very, very good point when we're going to talk about water chemistry. It's something that I'm dealing with. But when I was breeding things like Haplarchus siticus that I talked about earlier, Aplarchus siticus lives in extremely mineral poor water. Now, there's again, there's only one species of Aplarchus siticus, but it comes from two totally different watersheds, and they're vastly different in regards to their water parameters. And I honestly think down the road, eventually the species will probably become two. Not based on that, but there are other things. I bet you if we did some time, if I had specimens of both and we start kind of dissecting and looking inside of the physiology, there might be other other traits that are different, things that are other things that would characterize the reason for uh, differentiation of the species. But regardless, now the one from the Rio Negro and the other fish I've bred, the um, what's the name? Dichrosis filamentosis, uh, Tania caria candidii, I believe. These are all some of the things that I bred years and years ago. And I apologize if the names, those are both little dwarf cichlids. Uh, Nanochromus transvestitis, which is a West African dwarf cichlid, uh, checkerboard kind of thing. These are all little tiny, tiny fish. Other than the West African, the other ones are all South American in origin. All extremely mineral poor water. Now, the problem being with mineral poor water is if they breed, and they breed seasonally, generally in the wild. When they breed seasonally in the wild is after the flooded forest and all that live food and everything like that. These guys go out into the farthest reaches possible where there's all sorts of leaf litter and protection. That's their best chance because for the, uh, the rest of the year, they have to hug the bank of the Amazon, hiding under a leaf, just terrified of anything coming to eat them at any moment. But once the forest floods, they can move out and then they can actually uh, breed successfully. So the water is generally going to be warmer or at least more stable in those environments. The live food, the huge reduction in pH, and, and almost zero mineral content whatsoever. And that is key for the eggs because when I bred Psittacus, the only reason I was successful with Psitticum, because mine were wild, was uh, was uh, running the RO unit and basically replaced as the water changer ran. The RO unit was running water into the 750-gallon aquarium and basically just kept producing the hardness till it was almost non-existent. I still had some, um, I used a, like a pool filter sand that had some buffering capacity, but was minimal. So there was zero, a very, very low hardness, and I could bring the pH down to about 6.5, and that's when everything, all the magic kind of happened with all the driftwood and bogwood, and natural botanicals that were in the water and tannins and so forth. When I bred transvestitis, they were wild caught as well, and that was that West African, and I think we had the pH down on that one, down to like 4.5 or 5 or something like that, and that's the only way they're successful. Because calcium and minerals and stuff, the eggs, the egg shell itself, if we can call it a shell, is permeable. A chicken egg is permeable. It breathes. But the problem being is the eggs, the eggs of fish that breed in these extremely mineral poor waters, they can't tolerate all of a sudden a change in water chemistry. 
the calcium and the minerals leach in and destroy that egg before it even has a chance. And similar, it, it, it also kills the sperm before they have a chance to fertilize. So very, very good point, Mark. Correct. Now, is there anything else that I'm missing? Look at you guys. All sorts of stuff. Okay, let's get back to it. Water chemistry. This is one that's panting out to me for what, everything that's happening with me since I moved. Now, the two tanks that you see there, they are run exclusively using RO water. I buffer this one differently than that one there. Behind the, underneath the, the paludarium, the varium type thing, that's the, the Mexican Zephophorus Montezuma, the big giant sword tails. They are in RO water. The planted tank, we'll just give you guys a quick turn here. The planted tank is a 120. It's straight RO, and I buffer it manually using different types of agents and stuff. And then the two 160s, the two big bunk beds, the, the Central American ones, those are using straight raw well water. Now, not as I mentioned, not all water is created equal, right? You got well water, you got rain water, you got reverse osmosis, steam distilled. If you live in a city, every single city is going to be different. Hell, if I lived in one end of the city and you lived on the other, our water could be vastly different. Okay. When I lived in Winnipeg, Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada, our water was excellent. It was just above neutral, a uh, very, very good water source. It came from a lake called Shoal Lake at the time, and it may still very well be. Uh, if you used uh, any of the agents for removing chlorine, we never had chloramine at the time. I know chloramine is an entirely different agent, but uh, chlorine was very, very easy to break the bond. Uh, honestly, I bred so many, so many hundreds and hundreds of different types of species using Winnipeg water without too, too much change. Uh, but it was good that it had, it was stable and it worked well for most stuff. Now, when it came to working with things like uh, different species of, uh, of killifish, then I'd use reverse osmosis or whatever I wanted to do. But for most of the live bears, rainbow fish, things like that, it worked great. When I was breeding things like kerosens, different types of tetras, breeding different types of silver dollars or piranhas and stuff like that, then I would modify the water. Now, using reverse osmosis water, I can't say enough, and I do have a video coming out on reverse osmosis water, and I'm sure people are going to argue and yell at me and stuff like that because I'm definitely not an authority on reverse osmosis water, but I know how to use it for what I know how to do with it. But reverse osmosis is, as long as your system's running correctly, it's, it's, it's pure, about as pure as you can get. It's wonderful, but it's manufactured water, and it's extremely volatile. It's it. What it means is it desperately wants to buffer itself, and it will buffer itself using whatever it can find. So if I threw a shell, if I threw a leaf, I threw anything in there, it would basically take every aspect of that buffer out of that product, and it would alter the chemistry of that water. So because it's volatile, you have to buffer it one way or another. Now I tend to use a product called Seachem Equilibrium. And that stabilizes the water. It doesn't really alter the chemistry of it too much. It just stabilizes it, kind of locks it at what it is. And then I use different types of bicarbonates uh, and, and minerals and stuff like that to raise the alkalinity for fish like my Central Americans and stuff like that. And then when it comes to stuff like my planted tanks and the, and, uh, and the barb tanks and stuff like that are like riverine soft water fish, I tend to leave those guys alone, you know, and I like the water. But... Distilled water, same thing. Distilled water is just basically collected steam. It's again, it's it's super super pure, but again, it needs to be buffered. Rainwater, rainwater is rainwater. It's it's everyone thinks it's pure, but it's not. Depends on where you live. Like I live way out in the middle of nowhere in the country. My rainwater might be good, but the problem being is I also live, you know, hundred yards from a, a gravel road that trucks go down all the time, and it's a it's a it's a very gusty road. So everything on my property has got a film of dolomitic. Uh, limestone dust on it and stuff. So it's going to be on my roof. That means it's going to wash down my roof into my gutters. That means, you know, so like rainwater is not the same. If you live in an urban center, rainwater is not the same. There's all sorts of agents, chemicals, all sorts of stuff that are used that could end up into your rainwater. So it's like maybe your source is great. Mine, I'm not going to trust it, but I also manufacture 180 gallons of RO water every single day. So I don't need it, right? Additives such as buffers to increase or decrease pH, alkalinity, acidity, role of stabilization. 
sodium bicarbonate, baking soda. A lot of people back in the day used that all the time. It, it worked very, very well. It still does work very, very well, but it doesn't stabilize. And that's the one thing that it's absolutely missing. So if you are going to be using a product like reverse osmosis, you do have to buy some form of stabilizer to use. Different types of salts and things like that that need to be used. Peat moss, uh, black water. You can make black water. You can use uh, different types of woods. Uh, different types of botanicals, all these different leaves and stuff like that. If you want to increase uh, the, the, the pH and the hardness levels, you can use coral, dolomitic, uh, dolomite calciums, oyster shells, any of these type of things that will increase it naturally. Limestone, those type of things, they all work well. So water is absolutely critical. Why did I bring up water? Well, to give you, I want to let you guys in. I Biggs is completely transparent. I want to let everybody know. The tiger barbs breed constantly in that tank i do nothing i literally do nothing they and every time the pair spawns there's like the whole pack comes together and eats all the eggs there's not enough even though the tank is pretty heavily planted there's not enough plant life in that tank to, to sustain all the babies and stuff but i bet you if i tore apart that tank i'd probably find half a dozen to a dozen smaller ones they're there this tank uh, Water-wise, we already went over. I, I buffer it and everything like that. Everything works good. And I have no qualms with these guys, the Mexican live bears, anything in my planted tank. In my planted tank, I've got two species breeding currently right now. These guys go great. But in my well water, and I've, met, I've alluded to this before, my well water must have something in it that is odd. Now, I, I originally thought it would have been iron content, but I ruled that out because iron content – Shouldn't really be much of a factor for me because I know a good friend, uh, Mike Drotty down at Imperial Tropicals. If you ever get a chance, if you ever see the videos, uh, he has tons and tons of videos. He has a great channel. He puts puts stuff. He goes live every Friday. Uh, very, very cool, bud, and he's got great farm. But if you go into some of the older greenhouses and see those concrete vaults, they're blaze orange. And that's just the iron deposit from his water, from the ground. So iron's not really the factor. We get iron, we get orange on our on our uh, bathroom receptacles, our toilets and our showers and all that sort of stuff. And it's an absolute nightmare for my wife. And we've looked at the idea of buying an iron filter. But an iron filter for our house is about a thirty-five to $5,000 bill. We just haven't gotten around to pulling the trigger on it. And we also have to completely reconfigure everything in that mechanical room that runs our house. So it's a much bigger job than just simply buying a part and installing it. But there's something in our well water that fish don't breed in. So I'm going to have to do something different down the road or change something. Because in the bottom tank, I've got, I don't know, there's half a dozen of uh, Jim Cummings tuba. And they're, you know, that's a fish that's going to be slow to mature. They're growing up fine. But And I've got a whole big group of Mecca Splendens, which is a wonderful, wonderful Central American live bear. I never get any offspring from them. I've had lots of plants in the tank. You know, and I've had gravid females. I would think that maybe the fry are being predated upon. I don't think that's the case. I also have a beautiful, gorgeous, stunning pair of Cryptoheras myrna, which is a Costa Rican convict type. And I've shown you guys them in some of the videos. And the female is absolutely breathtaking. The male's got, you know, he's got, he's a looker too. He's got that beautiful blue eye. The trailers on him are impressive. And they are all all of like five inches in size. They're always together and they have never bred in this tank. And for me, that's, that's a sign that something's just not right. And there's, it's one of those pieces of the puzzle that I've never been able to figure out. The top tank, the Salvini, the Chetamulensis, all of them are all of size. They, they often pair up, but never ever see anything. So, but honestly, I'm not in a position where I'm going to be changing anything for them right now. Everything's good. I'm not trying to mass produce. I'm not trying to breed, breed, breed. I don't have anything to prove to anybody other than just my personal enjoyment and having some fun. Thanks, Candy. You've got your Mar is, uh, Mike's channel up there. Yes, Jay, Jay Wilson is on in a minute or two. And if you guys uh, want to go and follow him, that's great. I understand. If you still want to follow with me, I, I, I don't want to step on his toes, <coughs> but I'm going to keep going. We've got a few more things to cover if you guys are still interested. But if, if you want to go to Jay's channel, I... I I, I feel no ill will to you whatsoever. He's a good friend. Okay. We're getting towards the end, unless there's going to be specific questions. Uh, dietary. 
natural diet of the fish, I know it's going to sound like a shocker, but nobody comes down to the river and feeds them flake food or pellets or anything like that. So understanding the natural dietary needs of the fish, and a lot of that stuff can be denoted. A lot of it you can see by looking at a fish. You know, if it's got a real short or, or, or short, elongated, it's got real big, obvious canine teeth, it's probably a predator of some type. If it's got insanely musculature, heavily shaped head and jaws, it's going to probably eat something else, you know, like it needs something to be able to crunch and process something, you know, like a tilapia buttercophri is a molluscivore, a true molluscivore, and its pharyngeal plates or de dental plates are very, very obvious that it's it's a molluscivore with its large molliform conical shaped uh, dentition and stuff. But understanding those natural traits, where the position of the mouth is, the little live bears, these xenotokas, their mouth is positioned almost upwards. So they can actually eat off the surface and graze on things while still looking up. So that's a very, very cool evolutionary thing because their predators in the wild predominantly are going to be birds. So them sitting near the surface being able to eat. And a lot of live bears are, have that kind of an underslung mouth for being able to graze on algae, on plants, but still being able to observe. And if we want to look at that same type of behavior on the other side of the world, let's go into Lake Malawi, we have the exact same situation. Lake Malawi, you have fish like your Labiotrophus filiborni, your Labiotrophus trevase, trevavase. Uh, in Tanganyika, you have your Eret modus, the clown type goby types. All those types of fish have evolved that their eyes are in slightly different positions, the way their mouth is positioned, that they have evolved, their bodies now have switched. Instead of feeding like this, they have feeding like this. So they get to watch everything that's happening above them. And even there's other fish that have been involved in taking that even one step further is things like your anableps from Central America. And that's one fish I've only ever kept once. But Sandy knows it's on my absolute dream list. And I don't care what's in any of these tanks. The minute I get worried that those are available, <coughs> one of these tanks is set up for anableps. Super, super cool live bear. It's a live bear. Gets to be about a foot, depending on the region it comes from. They're pretty nondescript and gray. They got a black stripe down the line. That's about it. But they have literally bisected eyes. So they have four eyes, it looks like. The top two that are above the water surface, and that is bisected. And they have the other halves are below the water surface. So you can see above and below at the exact same time. Not only is that super cool and weird, but they are also right or left sex oriented. What that means is that you have to have a male that hangs to the right, and you have to have a female that kind of uh, accepts to the left. <laughs> this is PG-13. <coughs> but that's the only way you'll be able to sexually uh, to be able to reproduce them in captivity. They're also estuary fish, so they have very, very specific water parameters, a, a truly brackish fish. So you have to vary the salt content back and forth and stuff. I love that. I think that's a challenge, and I think that's one of those fish that's at the very, very top of my positive list of fish that I definitely, definitely want to work with. And fish. So if that comes down the road. That's great. So we talked about uh, the, the different types of foods, understand the physiology, how species work, to massive help in gardening success. Now, a lot of your basic fish, most of your almost everything Malawi, everything Malawi, literally everything Malawi, almost every single thing Tanganyika, most West African cichlids, every single barb that is in captivity, every single kerosene that's in captivity, almost all these things, almost everything will accept basic aquarium fare. As in, and, and the aquarium foods we have available today, you know, you've got pellets of a myriad of sizes, you got things in, in influx of bugs, you got different types of flake foods and different types of engineered pellets. This is astronaut food is what this is. To take a pellet, you've taken an entire meal and encapsulated it into a little tiny ball. So the fish is going to take the entire ball and process it and get a complete meal. That's super, super cool. As long as the dietary needs are met with those fish. You get all sorts of weird little foods like this. I don't know if you can see it. It's way too bright. This is Vibra by Hakari. This is uh, one of the products that my company up in Canada sells. I just thought this is way too gimmicky, way too weird. But the fish like it. And, uh, you know, when you look at the ingredients, I can see why. Some of the, it's, it's very good ingredients and stuff like that. But basically what's important is the food was engineered to look identical to like uh, to mimic 
feeding live bloodworms or frozen bloodworms. So it looks exactly like it. And in the water column, it kind of hangs in the water column. looks exactly like it. So the fish love it. I don't really care. As long as they work with it, I think it's great. <laughs> but what other options do you have? Like uh, somebody asked earlier about what to feed for zebra daniels. They'll eat the prepared foods as long as you get it small enough. But the other aspect is that you do have frozen fish foods. I, I rely a lot on frozen fish foods. I have a, I have a vast amount in the freezer and stuff, and I have a wholesaler uh, that's local that I can go and get stuff anytime I need. I don't rely a lot on it right now because I'm not actively push, 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 trying to do anything right now. Honestly, the summer times I alluded to at the beginning, I'm just trying to keep my head above water. <laughs> But to live foods, if you really, really want to breed tropical fish, depending on what your niche is. Now, if you want to be a nice generalized breeder, which is what I would say I was, I had 10 different types of live food going, culturing all at the same time. Isopods, they can be a live food depending on the type of fish you're keeping. Microworms, uh, vinegar eels, brine shrimp, uh, vermiculturing of uh, the red, uh, red wigglers. There's so many different things, Daphnia, uh, you know, different types of things. You could be culturing duckweed if you need it as a food source for something. So there's all sorts of different things, right? But uh, culturing all these different live foods could be something I, I can do an entire topic on. But the problem is I'm not really doing any of them at all right now. Uh, but if you're going to be breeding, say, rainbow fish, which have minuscule fry that hug the water surface, you're going to need something that is a food that'll be at the surface that is really, really, really small. Uh, baby brine shrimp, newly hatched baby brine shrimp is too big for most rainbow fish fry. And I'm talking big rainbows. Their fry are minuscule. Uh, all your glossolepsis types, all your melanotania types, all your pseudogale types, all those, they all need something far smaller. Now, back in the day, we used to make green water, which was easy to do on your windowsill. I alluded to it earlier. <coughs> um, the other thing we used to have available to us was a product called APR, which was artificial plankton and rotifer, another exceptional product. I don't even know if it's available anymore. Uh, but vinegar eels for, was, was absolutely key for success, for breeding any of those things, because it was microscopic. I could have a vinegar eel culture for 10 years completely neglected, and it'll still produce for me. Vinegar eels, I think, were one of the best for microscopic things. Now, if you're breeding things like Coriodorus, uh, things like that, that are, are meat eaters, you need to have something that's immediately to the bottom. And the perfect thing that worked for them was all these different types of banana worms, micro worms, all these different types of microscopic, almost nematode like worms that go right to the bottom right away. Uh, and they work, they are super, super easy to culture as well. The only problem being is that you have to be on top of maintaining and starting new cultures all the time. Because if you're, if you only have one culture and it sours, you're out of the game already. And you got to go and bug whoever, whichever higher level nerd had the microworm culture that you got from originally. But simple little Rubbermaids, Tupperwares you know, from your wife's kitchen, <laughs> things like that, discarded things, sour cream containers, whatever. Easy, easy, easy to do. We can do a video on them down the road, and I'm sure anybody can find anything they want on it online. So, but live foods, absolutely critical. Now, when I was uh, doing larger fish, depending on what I was doing, other foods that I've used, dried nori sheets, which is the California seaweed sheets. Uh, we use those for doing different types of trophies back in the day. A lot of the different herbivorous Central American cichlids, the more specialized ones, like the true riverine stuff that me and Dan Shreefy talked about in that video, uh, that most prepared foods are too high in protein. Feeding nori sheets was wonderful for things like irregularis, buller a lot of the names escape me right now, but those types of fish, those are the ones that have that very, very elongated, thin gut and cannot process large volumes of protein. So they need a much leaner diet and they need to be able to kind of almost graze. A lot of these new rapashi type gel foods, I and mean, there may be other brands, so I'm not trying to drop names, but using those type of gel products, if you get the algae-based ones, or even the insect-based ones, depending on your fish, I do use the insect-based one. And when I make food for feeding the isopods, I often, uh, and I have the one called morning wood for them, which is vegetable based. I also have one called bug burger, which is insect based. And I usually make them at the same time. And then I give all these guys uh, a good shot of that. And it's, it's in a gel form. So they, they make a big mess, but uh, it's great, great food. But the thing that's really cool about it is you could take rough rocks 
and you can actually apply these type of products to the rocks and then almost let them dry on the rocks and bake. And then you could take those rocks and then put the rocks in the aquarium and let fish graze on them naturally. Now, I remember back in the day, I see the books up there. I don't know which issue it is, but the cichlid yearbooks that Ad Coatings used to put out by Cichlid Press, there was some gentleman in, I believe it was Norway or Sweden or Denmark, made a natural off walk scraper that had this piece of PVC pipe haft, and he had this little micro screen that he put over top, and then he put nori sheets and things below it, and it gave that natural rasping behavior of all the different imbunas or trophies or things like that. You notice there's a lot of similarities between fish from Africa and North America and stuff like that. There will be different types of fish that fit the different niches. It's going to be the same anywhere in the world. So it's live food. Now, is there any individual questions that I may have missed? Is there any particular fish in question? Uh, the last thing I had was maybe kind of a spotlight on some different fish that we talked about. <coughs> Let's see if I missed anybody. See here, Jack and Dan. Duckweed is actually one of the few plants high in B12. <laughs> Sell it at GNC. <laughs> Every single aquarist in this room could supply GNC with enough. <laughs> and Mr. Ray Quinnell is here, my good friend Ray. Hope you're doing well. Hope everyone's doing well. So we talked about rainbow fish. We talked a little bit about imbunas. We talked about Central American cichlids. Now, Central American cichlids was kind of my big passion for my, my the big bulk of my last years and stuff when I was hardcore breeding, and they still very much are near and dear to me, and I have several species in the room right now. But you're talking fish that go from a three to four inch size all the way up to a meter. So there are definitely many different groups within that, and there is also many different levels of aggression, many different, different methods they all breed exactly the same way. They all are a, a, a platform spawner. They need a receptacle and they spawn. You know, Nicaraguense is one that's a little bit different in the fact that it doesn't have adhesive eggs. And that's because in the video, and whoever was, I remember somebody was asking about the video, and Candy put the link up, go look at the video and find out why, because it's super, super cool. But I think that's that type of behavior is absolutely fascinating. But every fish, is, all these fish that we're talking about, they all need a receptacle. Flower pot works, a piece of driftwood works. Like uh, if we talk about different types of things like plecos, plecos are all the rage right now. A lot of people are breeding plecos and stuff like that. And that's awesome. I love the fact that we're starting to see a lot more diversity of the fish that are being spawned in captivity. Um, and I'm not talking about, you know, just the onesie twosies. Like large scale, a lot of really, really cool fish are being bred in captivity. It's taking the pressure off the wild harvesting of some of them. Some like the Hypanthesia zebra, you ain't getting it out of Brazil legally anyways. And if we can get enough of them out there in the trade and the price can get to the point that it's affordable by most, maybe the smuggling trade out of Colombia will cease to exist because it just won't be cost effective to go all that distance to catch a fish to get it out of, out of a different country. So hopefully we'll see what happens. But Hypanthesia is a perfect example they are meat-eating plecos. And most of them, once you've bred one, you've kind of figured out the puzzle for mo almost all the species. They're all going to breed very, very similar methods. But the real trick is, like we've alluded to in some of the videos I've done with my good friends from Germany, Andreas Tanke, we did a two-part interview, and uh, he's known for Pinoculus primarily. And um, Birdman himself, Daniel Convetterlein, when we talked about the different plecos and things, the real key with understanding plecos is flip them over and look at the lips. Look at the lips. Look at the dentition. Anything you're going to need to know about that fish is going to be right there for you. Uh, but like when we talked with Andy, his, his primary passion, as I mentioned, was pinoculus, and that's a different genera. But pinoculus are all cave-type spawners, but they need wood to breed in. Now, some have been bred using tubes, but in uh, clay tubes or something like that, but there is always wood prevalent in their aquarium. They would not have a clay tube in the water. And taking a large piece of driftwood like that and boring maybe an inch and a half, two inch hole into that thing down to about four or five inches and creating kind of a tunnel inside that wood in different spots is a perfect receptacle for them to breed. Why is it critical to them? Well, because most people didn't figure out the, the the secret to the success in breeding that genera, but Andy did, and maybe other Europeans did as well. I don't know if he was the first, 
But uh, what the real trick in breeding them is that the offspring need to have something to eat. And their, their, main, their main component of their diet, being wood, is primarily going to be cellulose-based. So they got something. But it also gives an, an, an ability for the father who protects the offspring to sit there and graze while he's still in the cave. It's something you wouldn't be able to do using a clay tube. Now, all your ancestress, your bristlenose types, most of them are being bred pretty readily. But you talk about when you're bringing a fresh new wild cut import versus a hundredth generation albino, blue eye, calico, super red, long fin, whatever, whatever. Those things are so dumbed down, they'll breed in a, in, in, in a glass of water now. I know I'm dumbing it down a little bit, but you guys understand the point. Dealing with a wild caught fish versus something that's been in the trade and bred repeatedly over many, many generations is a vastly different situation. Coriodorus, there's some really, really world renowned Coriodorus experts. We've got several in, in, the, in the US and we've got some amazing ones over in Europe. People that are into Coris, they're, they're an entirely different animal. Once you start down that path, you're in it for a long haul. They just find it fascinating. But your basic Coris, your, your, your bread and butter Coris that you see at your pet stores, most of them you know, are going to breed fairly readily with one, maybe two triggers. Maybe you'll have to do a cold water change. Maybe you'll have to let the water evaporate a little bit first. Maybe you'll have to give them some blood worms, live food, whatever. One of those triggers. But some of these other ones, once you start down that road, they can get some of them get pretty, pretty specialized in the, 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 what you need to make them happen. And that's all just figuring out how those pieces of that puzzle go together. Odds and ends, uh, arowana, it's totally breedable in an aquarium. It's not breedable in that aquarium. It may be breedable in the 12-foot aquarium. It's definitely breedable at someone, say, like Big Rich's place in Ohio Fish Rescue if he wanted to. They're a mouth brooder. They come together and they breed similar to something like a kerosene, but then the, the they, they take the eggs into their buccal cavity and they protect them that way. Arapaima is the same thing, but I don't see if most people breed in Arapaima, but they're being bred commercially in Florida and they're being uh, for the food trade and they're being bred commercially all over Asia for food and for sport fishing. So it's figuring out the pieces of those puzzle that makes it work. I'm not trying to get you guys to the point that you say, hey, my goal now, Biggs, is I want to breed Arapaima. I don't think that's a logical, really good goal to have, but to each his own. Keep what you want because you like what you have. Okay. Uh, knife fish. We talked about knife fish in another video before. A lot of knife fish and things like that. The only one that we really I can really relate to with experience-wise would be like the clown knife fish. Uh, the black ghost knife, uh, from what we found, the black ghost knife from South America moves great distances. It is being bred commercially, but it's being bred commercially using uh, hormone induction. Uh, like a lot of different fish, all your different sharks, sharks, uh, red tail, rainbows, all those sorts of things, rose line shark out of India. A lot of these fish are being bred using hormone induction. And that seems to be about the only way of, of, of breeding a fish that actually moves like a salmonoid. They, 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 they're pelagic, they move these different areas. We can't duplicate that in an aquarium. We just don't have the ability to do that. Gobies, puffers. I, I've bred a few. I've, uh, I don't know even how know how many other species of goby. I don't know, you know what would you call a goby? Climate goby is Remius, the Ternadina oscillicata, the little peacock gudgeon, um, Magurnda, Magurnda. I don't know. There's probably about there, there might be two or three I'm forgetting, but they all were kind of the same. They uh, the turn to turn it to turn it the is that cool little peacock gudgeon, super prevalent in the trade, outstanding little community fish, hot hot pink with spots. They're sexually dimorphic that you can tell the boys and the girls apart when you're at the pet store. Uh, the 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 males get a large, not a nuchal hump, but they have a very pronounced forehead, and the females are very very streamlined in the in the point and stuff. So it was pretty cool. Easy to breed. Just give them a small little cutoff of PVC pipe. They love it. Or if they give it a little type of shelter, your little pleco caves and stuff, those would work as well. Now, puffers. I think I've bred three species of puffers. Now, the problem with them, as uh, Haley at Oddball Aquatics is finding out, is they are extremely gregarious predators on each other. <laughs> they are relentless at hunting each other down. So they... They're a bit more, they're not as much of a challenge to breed, but they're a hell of a challenge to raise. Clarius batricus was a, it was a catfish I bred many, many years ago. 
And uh, again, it was totally by fluke. It just happened to have them. Like, and that's the nice thing. If you have a nice big fish room, you got all sorts of diversity. You got barbs and you got plecos and corys underneath and you got a tetra above or something. And this tank's got cichlids and maybe you have some group of cats that come out only at night, a cleanup crew. And you have all these different types of fish. And you start opening up your mind and your eyes to seeing the behaviors. Don't just watch your fish. I always come down and feed my fish after dinner. No, no, no. Come see your fish in different times of the day. Come down at night. My old fish room, Ray would remember this, my old fish room had two light switches. And the reason for the two light switches was twofold. One, the one light switch was a normal light switch that lit up all the service lights. So if I was in there doing maintenance for a whole, a whole day, I didn't just have to sit there with just the aquarium lights. I could turn on kind of light up the whole room and work at it and stuff. The other light switch, if you came at night and all the lights, they're all on timers and all the lights were off. So if I was returning from a fish convention or whatever and I had fish with me and I wanted to land them, the other light switch was lit up. And the minute you turn that light switch on, it lit up service lights that were all red. It's, and I had red shields or red films over all of them. And it let me see the entire fish room. I could work in the whole fish room. It wasn't bright by any means. It would be like a, uh, somebody that works in a like a photography thing where they work in that dark room. And it's all lit up and you can see what you need to see, but it doesn't affect the fish whatsoever. And I could land fish. But I could often go in and sit in there. And I had a, you know, I had a little chair or stool that I put in the old fish room. And I could sit there at night with the red light on and watch behaviors. And you see things that you wouldn't normally expect. And some of those behaviors might be absolutely key to putting those last few pieces of the puzzle together for getting breeding success on whatever fish you're trying to work for. So if anybody's got any last questions, that's pretty much where I was going to leave it at. Put some of that duckweed in your smoothie. Snakehead breeding. Uh, the only snakehead I've bred was that one that uh, Paul Belanger in Edmonton had bred first and distributed offspring, and it was uh, Chana Blair Eye, the little rainbow snakehead. I did when before snakeheads became kind of a, a problem. Uh, I was working with a group of wild cots, Aromantiaca, I believe it was. I can't remember the name, but they were wild cots and. Uh, they were good for about a month and a half, and then they just started wasting away, and it was very, very challenging to get them back. And that was honestly the last time that I, I remember snakeheads being imported with any consistency whatsoever. I have never in my life seen the, that one that everybody just dreams of. Uh, I think it's called Barca. Never, ever seen that before in my life. I've seen it on lists from my local wholesaler, and I can tell you in all honesty, <laughs> beyond most people's budget. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, and whether it transports well, I don't know. They're all air breathers, so they should transport well. But no, I've never bred any other snakehead up that because most of them got too big. <clears throat> so with that, my friends, I thank you very much. Uh, next week, there's no live feed. Next week, is it next week? Biggs doesn't even know. <laughs> Maybe there's live feed next week. I don't even know. Next week, I was supposed to be a guest on a live feed on Friday, but I can't. It's Friday and Saturday. That weekend's a pretty important weekend for me with my wife. Uh, so I'm not doing it. It's not that I can't. It's just out of a matter of respect to my bride. So we're going to do something else. But next week, I don't know if there's a live feed or not. I don't have anything planned. Stay tuned. You guys watch it. See if it happens. <laughs> so with that, my friends, thank you very much for joining me. I appreciate it always. Anytime. I'll talk to you soon. See you in the next video. Take care, guys.